Hi, everyone. Welcome to today's webinar where we can help you streamline your processes by choosing the right automation strategy for your organization. My name is Amy Grendis. I have the pleasure of being your moderator for today's conversation. Before we get started, I just want to mention a couple housekeeping items. Uh, so the, the webinar is being recorded, so you can get a copy of this after the webinar ends, and you'll have that for your future reference or to share with any colleagues that you'd like to learn this information as well. Uh, we want to keep this session interactive, so there are a few polls throughout the webinar. We would really love to get your input, so please share your thoughts by voting in the polls. There's also the opportunity to ask a few questions at the end of the presentation. So anytime throughout today's webinar, please feel free to put your questions or comments in the chat or in the Q&A functionality within Teams, and we'll get to as many of those as possible. At the end of the webinar, we also have the opportunity to continue the conversation. So if there was any questions that we couldn't get to, please feel free to reach out to us and we can discuss this on a one-on-one -on -one setting. And we're also offering a free consultation with one of our architects to provide some additional guidance on your automation strategy. So in case you're not able to stay till the end, we can put a booking link in the chat now and we'll also just have a quick mention of that at the end of today's presentation. So getting into today's webinar, a few of the things we're going to cover today is how to define an effective automation strategy, when you might choose different tools like Power Automate or when you might choose Nintex, and how these two tools can actually work together to create the best results. And we're also going to have lots of real life examples from our customers throughout the presentation. So it's going to be a lot of great information today. To share these topics, I have two panelists with me. First off, we have Julian Charles. Julian is an enterprise architect at Elantis, and he has over 20 years experience working with Microsoft Technologies. Julian is very skilled at creating a technology strategy and then guiding organizations through its implementation for the best kind of results and really bringing value to organizations. Julian is also a Nintex virtual technical evangelist, and he was recognized in 2023 in the Nintex Solution Innovation Award for his passion and expertise in automation strategy. Welcome, Julian. As our other panelists, we also have Sarah Vanna. He goes by SK. And SK is an experienced solutions engineer. He specializes in workflow automation and low-code application development. SK has been a speaker at many M365 community conferences and other events where he's shared tips for effective automation strategy. And of course, he's been an integral part in assisting hundreds of clients in achieving their goals with low-code development. So welcome, SK. Thank you both for joining us. Thank you for having me. Great. So to get us started, I was, you know, wanted to share a couple interesting statistics. You know, up to half of automation projects might end up missing the mark, according to recent studies, and even less than a third of projects can actually be tied to financial outcomes when we think about automation projects. So. These are some telling statistics that things aren't quite hitting where organizations need them to be. So with this in mind, maybe you guys can share some key principles for developing an effective automation strategy. Great question, Amy, and those stats are insightful. Yeah, so the, the first step is a thorough understanding of your organization's unique goals and challenges. You know, automation should never be about adopting technology for technology's sake. Instead, it's about aligning your automation initiatives with that business strategy to drive a meaningful outcome, and that's what should be measured. Now, whether that's improving efficiency, reducing cost, or enhancing customer experiences. Building on that, it's essential to involve cross-functional stakeholders, now at a process owner and a process expert level, early in that planning process. By doing that, you basically create a strategy that not only addresses IT, but also supports business operations, compliance, and helps to provide that richer customer service experience. Do you want to add I'd, to that, SK? Yeah, I'd, I'd, I'd agree with you. And to add more on that, I would say um, balancing citizen development and IT development, uh, because citizen development has been making a lot of fuss in the last few years. I've seen that, and I've seen companies try and adopt that but fail miserably. Um, I'm not entirely against it. It does offer a lot of benefits, but if left unchecked, 
um, it creates a chaotic environment instead of helping you, right? So like I said, you would want to balance out citizen development and IT development in such a way that um, you include or you consult business uses as part of the solutions bill, but you wanna make sure that IT is the one that's governing it to make sure that you maintain these standards. A great comment. So, you know, building on kind of that strategy, there's lots of automation tools out there. So what are some of the key questions that organizations can consider when they're selecting an automation platform? Actually, I'll take that. Um, so I would, I would start from the most basic question, right? What is your automation goal? Um, it, it boils down to two different ways, um, whether it is a productivity improvement or orchestrating your business workflows. And, and let me explain, expand on that. What I mean by is that, um, so when it comes to improving the productivity, it means you have a lot of tiny workflows um, that doesn't require a lot of planning and, and can be easily approached and done. But if it's business orchestration, um, it needs proper planning, proper testing and implementation, and not one tool um, is, is best fit for both of these. Um, so that's what I would say. Look at what is your automation goal and then approach it accordingly. Yeah, if, if, I, can, if I can add my corny question, what are the specific pain points we're trying to solve? Right, That may be from a point solution perspective. It may be from an enterprise application perspective. But understanding the problem before defining the solution, we, we tend to jump into solutioning a little bit too quickly, in my opinion. We, we want to consider those things. We want to make sure we've got a solid defined problem before defining our solution. Because when you choose one thing, you're actually choosing not the other as well, right? That's that's something to be conscious of. Um, so additionally, you, you want to consider scalability. Can this tool grow with our organization? Um, and another important factor is the level of customization and flexibility that that tool is going to offer to adapt to the organization's unique needs and processes. Absolutely, those are great things to consider. So digging a little bit deeper into that, you know, some of the tools that our customers often use are either the Power Platform or Nintex. So you know, how can an organization decide which of those might be best in different scenarios? Oh, that is, that's a great one. Um, so, I'll, I'll start off. I'll start off with Nintex, and I'll use an example. Um, it shines in in environments where uh, kind of complex workflows, forms, and document generation are required and and essential. Um, it facilitates and enables deep customization via a robust set of features that can handle intricate business processes. Now, that's for organizations that need advanced logic, conditional workflows, integration with various enterprise level applications and systems. Nintex typically shines and is the better choice in, in that area. For example, um, an electronic uh, electric vehicle rebate pro program who sought to streamline some of their processes and automate some of them. One of these processes was determining eligibility. Now, whether a customer had already claimed a rebate and how much rebate they might qualify for, that's a traditionally cumbersome and slow process. Right, you're you're dealing with government. You're you're looking at a, a rebate that's facilitated to dealers on behalf of a particular individual, and it was slow. So they were looking for a quick and reliable way to verify that eligibility. And, you know, in a competitive market where timing, confidence, and accuracy of information can make or break a sale for those EV uh, salesmen. So we used an anonymous NAC form that used the context of the EV dealership to create a responsive form that could be accessed from anywhere on any device that was integrated with the provincial ministry's API. And that allowed for a real-time checks on a potential customer's eligibility for an EVP rebate. Now, so simply by entering a potential customer's driver's license number, a salesman could determine eligibility and rebate value which served as a fantastic icebreaker for starting that sales cycle and having that conversation. 
Now, Power Automate is also a fantastic tool for organizations that are heavily invested in that Microsoft ecosystem. It's particularly effective for automating routine tasks across M365 services. Its simplicity and ease of use make it ideal for what I call the, the quick wins and tasks that require less customization. And for organizations that are already using that Microsoft product stack, Power Automate offers seamless integration. It serves as a gateway into more complex automation if needed. Yeah, I agree with you, Julian, on that. And to add a little bit, I mean, the use case was fantastic, and I'm happy you've, you've done that for the customer. Um, I want to talk about like how Power Automate is good, but because Power Automate is also a fantastic tool. I, I use that a lot for a lot of my my personal workflows, like like monitoring Teams channel or Twitter feed or OneDrive or an inbox, and when something arrives, notify people or send tasks to maybe a few people, right? So those kind of use cases um, that are running within Microsoft ecosystems, um, PowerMate is so easy to do that, right? And, and whereas Nintex, on the other hand, I use that a lot for human-centric workflows, like, like Julian said. Um, so the workflows that runs between different teams and touches different departments and runs for a long time, um, I would go with Nintex. Great comments, thanks guys. And let's talk a little bit about, you know, maybe the advantages of using both of these tools together. Can you share a bit more about that? I can, I can do that. Um, so I, I talked about like improving productivity workflows and then like orchestrating business workflows, right? Uh, but like in, in real life, actually for most companies, it's a combination of both. And many people here will agree with me. Um, I'll talk about a customer who I work with recently. So they came to us and said that, look, we have over 400 workflows running in Power Automate and some of that runs well, some of that don't. And we don't know what we are not doing it right. And can you look at it and, and fix it? And so we, we, when we analyze it, what we understood is that they had a lot of um, productivity-based workflows and have a lot of uh, complex business workflows as well, right? The workflows, the app-centric ones, um, the personal workflows by individual business users um, that, that are running within the Microsoft ecosystem run so well. But on the other side, uh, processes like client onboarding, um, project intakes, research processes um, that could run for like months and years, right? Because Power Automate doesn't natively offer capability for you to do that, their team had to go with a lot of workarounds and they build it. It runs today. But whenever you want to touch that, make those changes and, and manage it, it has become so difficult, painful for them, right? So we gave them the Nintex platform. Uh, so instead of ch making changes to the existing ones, they rebuild the whole processes um, because Nintex is purpose built for that and a lot of the other components that you would need for these kind of workflows, like um, organizing workflows, tracking and, and auditing are all inbuilt and you don't have to do anything. Right, so they feel it is so much easier to do that in Nintex and keep the existing productivity improving workflows in, in Microsoft ecosystem to remain in Power Automate and whenever they overlap, some workflows I'm sure will overlap and because Nintex offers good integration, they've gone this way and fast forward now, you wouldn't believe they only have like less than 200 workflows uh, because a lot of these workflows were just sub processes that are created for the workarounds. Yeah. That's a great response. Great answer, SK. You know, I'd like to summarize. It, Nintex complements Microsoft. It, it, it fills gaps, um, like SK was alluding to, you know, where more advanced automation is required. You might need connection to other enterprise applications. You may have longer running processes that require some additional customization. Now, this provides synergy and it enables organizations to maximize their existing Microsoft investments while enhancing their overall automation strategy with advanced capabilities of Nintex. Right, yeah, I, I love these customer examples. Thank you guys for your comments. Could we dig a little bit further into how you could integrate the two tools to create the best results? Absolutely, can I go, SK? Do you mind? Yeah, do I, yeah, go ahead. Um, you know, I'm a, I'm a big believer in, you know, proof of concepts, pilots. I think a pilot project is a great way to test the waters. Um, it allows you to identify where those potential issues in a, in a controlled environment before actually scaling up, before going through, you know, your, your security and your compliance checks. Um, but also focusing on proper documentation. 
um, which can be a point of, of contention, right? Um, when we And when I'm talking about proper documentation, I mean the process models that are associated with the process that you're going to automate. Now, typically you're going to be consuming APIs and, you know, different connectors and the capability of these product suite, very similar. Um, but by ensuring that you've got a pilot project, you can ensure that basically you're simplifying that integration process. You might be able to stub some things out and say, hey, we are going to need some customization over here. We might need to use the, you know, the extensibility framework because we're connecting to a legacy system or there may be uh, a disparate API um, that, you know, you need to integrate with a form because it's got a, it, it needs to do some data load. And just to add compatibility, Compatibility is key, ensuring that your existing systems, these new automation tools can talk to each other through those APIs and that the connectors um, are able to communicate based on their triggers is extremely important. Now, you can use other middleware solutions as well that are available in the Azure stack for that if it's feasible, um, but this approach generally faci facilitates a solid data flow and improves the overall system um, interoperability. Now, I, I think SK might have something really cool to announce. Yeah, I, I'd like to add a little on that, uh, something interesting that, I mean, right now we have to integrate, I'm getting a little technical here. So to integrate Nintex and PowerMate, some of our customers use um, custom connectors and it is, it is not complex, it's just additional layer of configuration, uh, but to make things much easier, we're gonna have a two-way connector pretty soon that's gonna make everybody's job even easier, right? Julian talked a lot about integrating via API ways or using middlewares. That's, that's not gonna be needed anymore. All right, that's a great addition. Looking forward to seeing that. So, you know, we've kind of gone into the technical, but I wanna bring this back a little bit around to the strategy. So we talked at the beginning about, you know, creating that successful strategy could you guys share, you know, maybe some KPIs or metrics that organizations can use to track the effectiveness of their automation strategy? Absolutely. Um, yeah. Do you want to go, Julian? Do, do you mind, SK? Um, I'll be quick. Yeah, yeah. I'll be quick on this one. Um, so I'll look at it from a business perspective, right? Like, you know, obviously we can look at actions and how long a particular action is looking. There's a tremendous amount of, of, of KPIs and, and information that we can we can harness from um, from these workflows, from these processes. But cycle time reduction, understanding your cycle cost and how many times that process is going to execute will have light bulbs go on for your stakeholders typically, you know, Atlantis does basically a gap analysis. We look at current state, future desired state. We're able to tell you what your current state cost is and what your future predicted return on investment is. And then we do a comparison between that. And, but it's not just, when I say cycle time reduction is a key metric, absolutely it is, but it's also error rates. Now that means reduction in human errors. We're human, we make errors. Um, that can significantly improve quality and efficiency as well. Um, that that metric com combined with your ROI just basically helps to justify the automation efforts back to the stakeholders. And SK, you wanted excellent. to add as well? Yeah, I love Julian's response. Like he went in depth about getting into process level, showing those tiniest little improvements and then metrics. Um, I want to talk a little bit on, on a high level. Like uh, when you want to see what exactly is the metrics and see how whether it is successful or not, is that you want to see the end users adoption, right? At the end of the day, we're building it for them. And if the end users are adopting it and with no complaints, it means that is a success on a high level. And number two, um, in successful organizations who have implemented automation, um, I've seen that the number of workflows they've automated grows exponentially. In year one, it could just be 10. In year two, it could be 30 or 40, right? And I've seen companies even establish center of excellence. And it's not like a complex thing. It could just be like a business analyst who worked closely with the IT in the initial implementation. And then moving forward, they, they work with different teams, different departments and innovate processes across the organization. Um, the, if, if you have established um, things like that, that means it's a clear win. That is a testimony of your, of your work. 
Great, great answer. Great reference to center of excellence, CLEs, user adoption and, and satisfaction. They're, they're equally important, right? The best automation strategy you can come up with won't succeed if users don't embrace it. So true, absolutely. Great, well, thank you guys so much for your comments. I wanna open up a little bit to the floor in terms of any questions that we have coming in. So again, if you in the audience have any questions, please put those in the chat or put them in the Q&A functionality. Uh, we do have a couple questions here. So um, could you share any real world examples of an implementation strategy or an automation strategy that you know, had a big impact? May I? May I? Certainly. Um, Go ahead. So earlier I made reference to um, an electronic electric vehicle rebate program that was, you know, they sought to streamline and, and automate their rebate application process. Now, what does that mean, right? So we have a case study um, on Atlantis.com, shameless plug, uh, just do a search for um, case study Atlantis and uh, clean energy vehicles, which is, you know, at the core of the green economy, let's say, right? Like we are, we're switching to a green economy. Now, this is challenging because the collaboration between the customer, the provincial ministry, as well as Atlantis um, is complex. Whenever you've got multiple parties looking to define a solution, you're basically adding a layer of complexity, right? So we used a process management tool that led to the successful automation of, a, of the vehicle rebate process. But this new system not only met the project's objectives, but we positioned that solution to scale. So as the program grows and demand grows, so will the scale of the solution. Now, for us, that project serves as a model for how organizations can leverage technology to improve operational efficiency and enhance that service delivery. Nice, that's a great example. Thank you, Julian. And I see that we have in the chat a link to some of those case studies. I didn't cut you off there, okay. did I? <laughs> no, you didn't at all. I, I, I think the case study can speak for itself. If, if there's additional questions, we'd be happy to answer them. Fantastic, thanks for sharing that example. And uh, another question is, you know, why wouldn't an automation strategy work? So is there any things to avoid or, you know, mistakes that are commonly made? Is it, is it okay if I take that, Julian? Yes, SK, I run. Can, I, yeah, please do, please do. I can think of a common one. It's, it's very simple. Um, what I've seen is that when companies look for automation, what they end up doing is that they just reinvent or rebuild the existing manual process, right? And it doesn't mean, I mean, it's often misunderstand that they implemented automation and that they have not seen any benefits out of it. It's because they have not done it right. So I would advise them that when they are looking to automation, um, be a little bit flexible, reevaluate how you want to run the process and, and be ready to make some changes. Um, if they don't, um, like initially it could be challenges if you make changes because nobody likes it, uh, but in the long run, it's totally worth it. So this is what it is. People are just trying to digitalize their manual process instead of doing digital transformation. So succinct and so accurate, SK. That is that is one of my one of my pain points when it comes to um, implementing automation is that realization. Had wait a sec, we just basically digitized a manual process, and we still involve the same actors, the same roles, right? Without really looking at the opportunity to automate that thing. Great answer. Love that. Thank you guys so much for sharing. So for our audience, if you have any additional questions about how you can improve your automation strategy, please reach out to us. Uh, as I mentioned, you know, you have the opportunity to meet with one of our architects, maybe Julian can chat with you a little bit or SK, uh, and share some tips on, you know, specific to your organization. If you have some unique challenges you'd like to discuss, or, you know, just looking for some general guidance and recommendations to improve your automation strategy, we'd be happy to help. So we'll have a link in the chat and in our follow-ups to book that call. Uh, as well, you know, we'll be following up with the recording, as I mentioned at the outset, as well as a white paper on the state of automation in 2024. So there's definitely some interesting uh, statistics about and tips on, on automation strategy in there. So thank you guys again for presenting. We really appreciated your input and thank you to all our attendees as well. Have a wonderful day.
Thanks. Thank you so much.